Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded on Gail Muggle land by me, Liam Miller, he, him, his, a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. Love, Rinse, Repeat is also part of the Uniting Mission and Education family here in the Synod of New South Wales and ACT, and you can check out the show notes for their upcoming Preach Fest, which is an upcoming exciting festival looking at the art of preaching and why it matters. Today on the podcast, I am welcoming Kylie Crabb. Kylie, welcome along. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Liam. Great to be here. So for those who don't know, Kylie is a Senior Research Fellow in Biblical and Early Christian Studies at Australian Catholic University, where she's also the Director of Graduate Research Programs. Uh, you, she did her, uh, wait, I've lost, the, I've lost the note I was going to say next, uh, <laughs> um, but I'll just keep pushing through that, that um, now I'm blanked so hard, <laughs> oh dear. It's fine. I am. Um, I was going to go, I was sure you were at Oxford. That's where you yeah, did your yeah, doctorate. Yeah, yeah. Great. All right. Well, you did your doctorate at Oxford. I'm going to push through and we'll see how it plays out and whether I edit it. Um, <laughs> you can just doctorate. edit the thing and drop that bit out and then start again with. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, here we go. She did her doctorate at Oxford and has recently published the book Luke Acts and the End of History with De Gruyter. Here we go. Took a shot. Uh, and it is out now for anyone who wants to check it out, or it's in uh, Camden Theological Library for folks who are up in Sydney. You can check that out. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, Carly, I guess before we get to the book, uh, and more specifically, I'm just curious about, you know, what drew you to, I guess, biblical studies, to, to, to academic work, to, you know, going, I'm going to go and move and do a doctorate and, and all that kind of stuff. What was that kind of path for you that got you to the point of, I guess, being able to write this book? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, just so just like a kind of small couple of questions there. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> um, easy. Absolutely. So uh, people will know that I'm at Uniting Church, um, Minister of the Word as well. So I was um, in a parish in Melbourne in Armadale, the Armadale that's a suburb of Melbourne, not the one that's in New South Wales, <laughs> um, and uh, which I loved. It was fantastic there. And, and I worked um, uh, within that time. I had about a day a week where I would um, lecture and shoot um, for uh, what uh, became Pilgrim Theological mm. College um, uh, and also uh, did a bit of tutoring as well at Australian Catholic Uni back then. Um, and I... I found it great. I also found the parish ministry great, um, mm. but I felt this strong sense of call to um, that I was kind of being invited into a kind of teaching space and into a research space that I needed some more skills for, really. Mm. And that, um, and then a kind of series of things happened that made it possible for me to um, imagine living overseas and then taking up. Um, uh, taking up doctoral study at Oxford mm. um, and then I stayed on there for a little bit teaching and came back to um, return to Melbourne and to work at Australian Catholic Uni in 2017. Um, so I guess within that so I always had done stuff on um, in in biblical studies especially but, um, often kind of theological interpretations mm -hmm. of various kinds um, and I think when I was imagining what kind of doctoral projects I wanted to work on some of the pressing questions that I just kept coming back to, and people will know that if you're going to even imagine doing a doctorate, it's got to be on something that can totally like get you out of bed every morning for three <laughs> years and, and just make you want to, you know, because there'll be bits of time when it's not feeling that inspiring, mm. even with the best topic. So it has to be something that really um, is a burning question for you. Um, and for me, um, those questions were really around um, how do people make sense of their experience um, and especially of negative experience. So real questions mm -hmm. of theodicy, how do we make sense of suffering and the justice of God? Um, and so how do we, and, and, and for me, that was then a, a question of like, well, what are the, um, what do the biblical writers say about this stuff? And what do the writers in their context say? How do biblical writers um, differ from um, those, other, those other writers in their literary setting or uh, what are the mm. continuities really? Um, mm. as, as a kind of um, common experience. So that was really real for me in my own life, wanting to make sense of, of suffering and grief. Mm. Um, and it was also, I think, something that I became really aware of um, in terms of um, uh, certainly in congregational ministry, but not only amongst the congregation, but in all the people you interact with in that kind of setting. 
that this is a burning question for people. Like, mm. what does God have to say in in the face of suffering? What has God God got to do with our suffering? Mm. And um, how have other people throughout history um, tried to make sense of that experience faithfully? Mm. Yeah, single as you were, as you were saying, uh, you know, yeah, what what drew you to it, and you know that yeah. that idea of being in congregational ministry beforehand, when you you kind of are aware of the suffering, not only as you say in the congregation, but just around yeah. and yet and have to kind of front up to the biblical text each yeah. week and go, okay, well, I've got to speak about this. And and from this, I have to be able to maybe say something conjured to, to, to these yeah. crises or, or, you know, whether or not you're directing them, uh, directly yeah. addressing them. But um, yes. So do you feel that that kind of helps shape or like you know because obviously a PhD is a very you know specific kind of process with its own rules and regulations yeah. but like yeah. obviously you were also bringing that in do you feel like that helped shape the process or some of the ways you went about it or or, or maybe occasionally helped on the odd day get out of bed because you're like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know remember <laughs> <laughs> that's right but yeah. was there any kind of uh theological solace that I found in, in yeah, the- yeah 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 oh yeah and um, oh, absolutely but and I think also um I mean, that was kind of my entry point. And then I mm. discovered all of this kind of existing conversation um, mm. within the study of Luke and Acts that I wanted to address and challenge. But, but certainly I think our own, I mean, the best, I think the best historical work comes from um, uh, uh, our pressing contemporary questions. So um, it's not just, mm. I, mean, I mean, yes, we deal with the biblical text in its historical context, but you know, you could ask you could ask all sorts of questions that wouldn't be at all interesting. So you know, what is it that is interesting to us that has a pressing kind of contemporary need? And I, I mean, people will have experience of this. People saying um, uh, just bizarre things to people who are grieving and um, having having um, a, a time a terrible time of suffering, and and that the biblical text can be enlisted in that in a really deeply unhelpful way. Um, and which is not mm. to say that there, I mean, some of that will be misinterpretation and some of it will be that there are just really tricky texts we need to be careful about if we're wanting to use the Bible um, to think through um, our, our current experience, I, I guess. Mm. Um, so I wanted, um, so it was both um, kind of wanting to address those contemporary concerns, but also to sort of challenge the biblical text in some ways too and go, well, where does this not fit with um, other kind of um, theological perspectives we might um, imagine and mm. um, we might hold in other contexts or where do we need to be careful to challenge our theological assumptions on the basis of what the Bible does say mm. um, and where does the Bible not quite say what we might um, you know superficially assume it says uh, right. and that might lead people to say um, sort of funny things to people who are going through a hard time so you know so some yeah. of that corrective I guess yeah. yeah, that's really helpful. I think that's great. So before we get again into the book, I want to, so it's on Luke and Acts. So I've got a question yeah. about Luke and a question about Acts um, that as, as a scholar, you can, you can help us so that, because I think I remember you making this claim some years ago when you spoke at School of Discipleship um, oh, Conference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to assume you believe it, especially because you wrote the book. Um, <laughs> if it's not, then, you know, we'll go around. That'll be um, an interesting conversation yeah. too. Yeah. What, why, <laughs> give me your pitch for why Luke is the best gospel. Oh, <laughs> did I claim that at school of discipleship that it was the best? I, I, I you know, I, I remember. I think you were making the argument for, against maybe someone who thought like it was um was making an argument for Mark, and you were talking about all the things you miss if you, if yes, you go with Mark. Right. And you, so you don't yeah. want the the prodigal son. You don't want you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're happy the with a gospel that's just missing, you know, the Emmaus walk and the yeah. prodigal son and all those things. Yeah, um, <clears throat> totally. Um, the yeah, so I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure I'd say it's like out and out the best, but I think that um, the, I definitely have some affection for it, I guess, having spent so much time with it. Um, but I, uh, I guess it does have, um, so I take, I don't know if people think very much about how to make sense of the relationships between the Gospels, mm. um, but I would take the view that um, Mark is written first. Um, and so there are things that are really um you know, exciting about Mark because it's short and mm, it's mm. not just in a, it doesn't take you long to read kind of each <laughs> short way, but like, it's really dynamic stuff is mm. happening all the time. It's got this kind of catchphrase. It's like, and then immediately blah, 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 blah. And it keeps on pressing on. Um, 
and uh, so that has its own kind of gift. And yeah. and then there are other the other gospels build on Mark. So Mark is a kind of essential building block. Um, Matthew then builds on it, and uh, you know includes the famous teaching passages that we all know, like um, the the Sermon on the Mount passages, so the Beatitudes and mm. and stuff like that. Um, strong and and challenging um, words for discipleship. Um, mm. And then Luke. So some people would say that. Anyway, this is a very complicated part of looking at these um, relationships. But basically, some people would say that Luke and, and Matthew both use Mark and something else that we no longer have. And then some people, perhaps a growing group of people, would say that Luke is, is written his text with a copy of both Matthew and Mark. And I may be more in that school mm -hmm. of thought. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't always matter a heap. So we don't want to overstate the importance of the differences. Sometimes mm. the point is that they all say very similar things and we should pay more attention to <laughs> that instead of overstating the differences. Mm. Um, but Luke is, in my mind, building on both of those and does some interesting things with it. You know, like I think it is genuinely interesting that uh, Matthew has introduced infancy narratives that have um, uh, Zachariah as the kind of, um, sorry, not Zachariah, that's in Luke, um, have Joseph as the central yes. character rather than Mary, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we get to Luke, we've got this pair where we've got Zachariah and Elizabeth, and yep. then we've got um, Mary and Joseph, but it's from the perspective of Mary. So we get this like these subtle changes and reworkings that really open, open up the diversity to us, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily... I, you know, you would lose so much richness if you just read one gospel all the time, I guess. We mm, read these together. Yes. And then John, of course, is um, in a way a whole other kind of thing, but in another way, maybe also an interpretation of Mark, but in a different way from mm. the way Matthew goes about it. So, mm. yeah, no, good, thank, there's good stuff in there. <laughs> thank you for that. So the question about Acts then is, look, you know, I think there's definitely a case to be made that Acts is, you know, Luke has about three good stories and he's going to stretch it for... <laughs> way too long by 28 basically, chapters <laughs> yeah 28 chapters i'm going to repeat the stories two to three times each yeah um and then i don't really have an ending so we'll just <laughs> you know that's good we got it um yeah. and between that it's it's just a lot of kind of walking and talking uh so give me the pitch for why why it's why why axe is you know not that <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> well, I mean i think that's actually quite a good summary in some ways like there is there is that right as well it's worth remembering that you know the story of cornelius and peter it's told a couple of times mm. the story of paul's experience mm. on the damascus road um encountering jesus is told three times so there is a little <laughs> bit of repetition and then there are sort of what we might call what some people would call type scenes where there are things mm. that happen that are different stories but they've got some shared features. So you see the kind of momentum building mm. up, um, whether that's Peter's conflict with um, the leaders in Jerusalem that happens a couple of times or uh, Paul kind of storming out of synagogues and things like that, that all builds up as mm. well. So um, I think what's interesting, there, there are lots of things that are interesting about Acts um, and part of it is, um, which I think actually what you're getting at there with the repeated stories, it tells us something about the genre of acts, like that this is a kind of, um, I, I was speaking on the, um, do a little cross promotion of podcasts on the By the Well podcast a couple of weeks ago. And um, Fran Barber was describing acts as a rollicking tale. And I think that's <laughs> true, right? This is how it kind of unfolds. Um, so it's not just, it's not, we should be really careful, I think, in thinking of acts as being like a historical account of, mm of the early church. It is a literary work. And even um, ancient writers who wrote histories will point out that they're, that they're writing it, they're writing about things, um, uh, giving an account of events, but they're doing it in a way that is a literary work that, that when they have speeches, they're um, making them up, imagining what that kind of person mm. would, the kind of thing they'd say and writing it down. So um, we are often really tempted to talk about the historicity of Acts in a way we we're careful not to do in the Gospels, yeah, like right, Gospels because there's four, we don't get sucked into just assuming exactly <laughs> historical stuff. But at the same time, it is a kind of inspiring and interesting story about, um, you know, the way in which Luke is trying to make sense of what it would mean <clears throat> as a discipleship community to live as though this story we've already heard in the Gospel is true. If this mm -hmm. is true, 
that <clears throat> like not in a in a narrow historical kind of sense but if it is true of the universe that mm -hmm. jesus has died and been raised this has reshaped the universe and then how does the story unfold it unfolds mm -hmm. in ways that show jesus as having been ascended you know when stephen dies he sees jesus um uh there at the right of god um and as the kind of authority in the universe it's not it's not rome anymore that's the mm. authority this this is the authority it's radically reshaped you know the fabric of the universe and then there's this sort of a bit actually i think like mark um where there's this where in mark there's that breathless kind of yes. and immediately sort of thing this there's this momentum in acts where things mm. keep happening and in fact there's this funny thing which does then end up relating to my book a bit that there's this funny thing where wherever there is a block to the proclamation of the good news in acts something ironic will happen like mm. there'll be persecution in jerusalem and they all have to skedaddle to other places and the flip side of this is that suddenly well that means that they're all out there now proclaiming yeah. the gospel to the new regions and then it continues <laughs> so there's this kind of ironic furthering of the gospel despite mm. um opposition to god's yeah. um God's way. Oh, well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> so, so the book you say is you, you talk about, you know, you're interested in this idea of how we respond to your know, negative experience, particularly, but how to have a negative experience. So then I'm curious of how that then gets you to the point of looking at history and time yeah. and eschatology, um, which obviously kind of, as you point out in the book is, is a huge area of Luke and studies is 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 debates about what exactly is Luke's yeah. understanding of, of eschatology yeah. and time and things but I'm just curious yeah maybe before getting into where your book fits in that kind of debate unless that's where mm. it goes that's fine um how how it goes from that question about feeling and theodicy I guess to mm. a question of time and um and history yeah yeah um so I mean when we start thinking about hope I guess, mm. and that's mm. one of the responses um, to bad things happening, maybe if that's the way to talk about it. Um, we sort of do end up in this kind of temporal tension, thinking about, you know, is my hope in something that is like right now, or is there some kind of dynamic here that, you know, the hope that this is my lowest ebb, or this is, you know, I get through the day and then, um, then there's tomorrow kind of thing. Mm. Um, so there's there's this dynamism in the way that we experience time that is really relevant to early Christian proclamation as well. About, um, time and uh, mm. what has changed in in uh, in Jesus in the in the kind of understanding of these early Christian texts and and what is still yet to change and mm -hmm. and how you live in that in that tension. Um, the and the other part to that so there's so there's that kind of sense of time within the understanding of history um and certainly that comes to the title of the book about luke acts and the end of history the way that early christian texts think about the anticipating the end even um in the present difficulty however that's understood mm. um but the other thing is attention in how history itself it's you know the progress of events over time like and I mean that like not just history like the way we would read a history book now I mean history mm -hmm. in terms of like the scope of all history from creation yeah. to the end or however that works but people's experience um at, in terms of the the explaining events as they happen to to us you know like how is God involved in our experience how is God mm. involved in the world um is God responsible that the things that have for the things that happen in human history? Um, and in fact, there that so that is, I think, a kind of contemporary question that people, well, it's a probably a ubiquitous question that people <laughs> ask in all sorts of different contexts and times. Um, but one of the reasons why those two things, even though they seem kind of a bit different, the mm -hmm. understanding of the ways that God and humans have um, agency in history, the way we can make things happen or not mm, in history mm. uh, and understanding time in terms of anticipating an end or a change in history um, the reason that those things might fit together particularly well is because there was a real obsession in lucan studies um, in the post-war so post second world mm. war period 
um, which came in part from worries about um, this kind of stuff in philosophy of history in the way that um, really Nazism uh, had an, its ideology of history, which was this idea of, of progress, that things would mm. always be getting better. And this, this idea that in fact, there was a divine um, uh, imprimatur in how things, you know, that, that God is in charge of the way things are unfolding and things are unfolding uh, in the way that the Nazi regime wanted them to unfold. Mm. So there were Christian theologians and Christian biblical scholars who were understandably very worried about that yeah. um, as, a, as a way of saying that, you know, whatever you see before you must be what God has done. And, mm. you know, this kind, we see this also in ancient texts, this kind of um, philosophy that's about, you know, sort of, sort of like a might is right kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's like the people who are the victors, the people who are the strongest, they must be the ones um, that God mm. is behind. Mm. And there were biblical scholars in this time. In fact, the most influential biblical scholars of, um, in terms of those who read Luke um, uh, actually really disliked Luke. Like, so <laughs> there's, <laughs> so Hans Kunzelman, who's the main person, um, if he were to answer your question about tell us why Luke is best, he would be like, oh, no, 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 no. Totally, <laughs> Luke is not the best. Because they thought, they were really worried about this idea of identifying um, that God's, God's plan being acted out, like we see in Acts, when I mm. said before that God's way could um, uh, could be opposed, but it couldn't be stopped. And somehow, yes. this, you know, they would see that as they were really worried about it mm. and thought that it looked like uh, the kind of thing that the Nazis were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so I my analysis is to kind of say that was a very particular Con, like historical context where they're worried about those things and they've sort of skewed Luke in worrying mm. about that. And mm. at the same time they said, um, uh, so that's a problem, this kind of idea of divine action being causal in, in history in this kind of way. Uh, and they also said, well, and Luke has no interest in the end of history. It's just totally mm. complicit with mm. the events of history and you end up being kind of complicit with the Roman empire if you do that and there's no eschatology. And I'm like, well, actually, there's quite a lot of eschatology in Luke Acts. <laughs> and we might see that if we're not as worried as Hans Kunzelman was about those other questions. Mm, yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So you draw then to kind of, I guess, to, to work this out and what exactly Luke is thinking about history and time, draw him into conversation with a pretty wide raft of, yeah. of, of, of other um, texts of the time and preceding him. Um, I guess I'm just curious a bit about that process because one that seems like making a lot of hard work for yourself um <laughs> and uh, True. i don't know why you weren't there to tell me not to do this first. <laughs> um too much work yeah so i'm curious about like i guess why you thought that, you know what what that helped on earth for you but i guess and i guess part of it also like what how you had to try to figure out your way through that in a way that was manageable but but responsible to those texts yeah yeah yeah, nice uh, pick up there. It was a, a heap of work and also like really complicated to kind of um, balance all those things. Mm. Um, so, I mean, this also feeds into another debate within Luke and study. So all of that stuff is, mm. uh, and those kind of views from Hans Kunzelman continue to be really dominant in Luke and studies, but they're kind of in the background. They're just kind of assumed sort of things. People will just easily say, oh, well, Luke, of course, has this idea of a delayed parousia, like a delay of the return of, of Jesus. And everybody just nods wisely and said, yes, yes, of course, that's what he's got. Um, but the, um, the other more recent focus within Lucan studies, um, sort of actively researched, is a worry about genre. So there's, there's loads of, there are loads of studies about what genre are Luke and Acts and um, it's an important question, but it's also not, as I argue in the book, it's not an end in itself. You can't just like spend ages debating, mm. um, uh, you know, if something is a historiography, an ancient historiography or a biography or a um, epic or mm. a novel, uh, and then say, right, in conclusion, it's this. And then that's all we have left to say about Luke <laughs> Acts. That I want to say, well, that's important because however we read texts, um, uh, you know, the genre, basically, the way I understand it is it sets up expectations. So if we are mm. to read something that mm. starts with once upon a time and ends with they lived happily ever after, 
we're immediately in this headspace about like, I know how to read this kind of yeah. story. It's not going to be real, but it might tell me, it might have some kind of moral kind of story mm -hmm. to it or something. It's mm -hmm. a fairy tale. Um, so we need, we need to know what we're working with here. And part of the reason, of course, this is so contentious in uh, gospel study at the moment is because our gospels, I mean, even if they are historiographies or biographies, they're not the most standout version of that genre. They're already being adapted for other mm. reasons. So it's not obvious, it's not always obvious, but it would have been um, for early readers, they would have had, it would have set up some kind of framework of expectations. So one of the things that I've said is the reason that people have not had to rethink this kind of assumption about Luke not having any eschatology um, is because we've become really interested and in narrow um, narrow in our comparisons. So we only read Luke Acts in relation to other, normally in relation to other Greco-Roman, non-Jewish, non-Christian histories. Um, so when we do that, there, there are some similarities that are in terms of the form of the text, and that's interesting and important to notice, but uh, they're not the same in terms of some other things, like mm. the ancient historiographies are not thinking about the end of history in the, mm. in the same kind of way as early Christian texts are thinking about it. So part of the argument of my book is to really, is that this is the one that is directed more towards Lucan scholars than it is to, kind of, <laughs> it's probably not as interesting to anybody else, but to say, no, we really, if we're going to talk about some of these themes, that transcends genre. One of the mm. reasons we know that this can transcend genre is because uh, some ancient writers wrote in a whole lot of different genres themselves, but had, you know, so Seneca writes in a whole lot of different genres, but his stoic beliefs are consistent mm. throughout his works. Mm. So we know you can have different genres that, that still communicate a certain worldview. Mm. And that means that Luke, while he might have written something that looks more like ancient historiography, can have the kind of beliefs about the universe that we might see in apocalypses. Mm. Um, and, and that then comes through in a different way. So the, in order to kind of, I was quite, um, yeah, I was quite concerned to kind of push this and to show people that you couldn't just compare to one genre. Mm. Um, but I, in the process, I also realized one of the reasons why people do that, because it's easier. It's much easier <laughs> to just pick, you've got a nice delimitation there yeah. and you say, oh, well, I'll just compare to these few historiographies mm. or something. Um, and it is difficult. So I picked 10 case study texts. Um, five of them are Jewish texts and five of them are non-Jewish Greco-Roman texts. Mm. Um, all of them are between uh, kind of second century BCE up to the second early second century CE. Mm. Um, and I compared them on, on these different measures, even though they're all different genres. So some are mm. historiographies. Some are, um, well, one is like an exemplar, which is like a series of sayings kind of thing, yep. um, sayings and, and sort of anecdotes, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is not as kind of higher class a kind of um, <laughs> literature as some of the other things. And then, you know, then I also have um, uh, Virgil's Aeneid, which is an epic poem people mm -hmm. might know. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a text from the Dead Sea Scrolls and, mm -hmm. and Apocalypses. So all different genres in order to, sort of underscore the point that you can have different worldviews without sharing the same genre. And if we're going to do proper comparisons, we need to look at the full range of uh, literary context for the yep. text. Yeah. Mm, thank you. So then thinking about, you know, given what you've looked at Luke's eschatology and eschatology is, you know, in many ways about hope. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I got two questions here, I guess, is in, in what does Luke hope or what does hope look like or mean for Luke and thinking about that, do you think it is out of, not out of step is too strong, but it doesn't diverge from say his, the other gospel writers or from Paul uh, mm -hmm. in the way they would experience and explore hope. Um, you know, cause I think that's part of what we're saying here is, you know, to take the eschatology is probably to say, Luke has a very different understanding of hope than, mm -hmm. you know, is somewhat out of step then with the rest mm -hmm. of other parts of the New Testament. I'm just curious if you think, as you kind of explored what is the hope or what is the thing that you do in light of the esch eschaton mm. for Luke? And is that, you know, having thought about this more in line with his fellow folk in the canon, um, yeah. or, or does he remain kind of on his, you know, not on his own, but but slightly diverged? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. But um, in an, a kind of um, 
early version of a, of a kind of short synopsis of my argument for my doctorate, I wrote something from one of my supervisors that said, you know, basically Luke's a lot more like the rest of the New Testament than any, like in conclusion, kind of Luke's just a lot more like the rest of the New Testament than anybody ever acknowledges. He's like, <laughs> eh, doesn't sound that, I feel like you've got more to say than just that. I'm like, oh, but part of, part of what I'm saying is that. And it's, mm. it's kind of weird that that's an important thing to sort of say, right? Mm. Um, so, I mean, I still would sort of stand by that, that there's, <laughs> it's actually about noting the continuity. There was this assumption that, you know, people get quite sort of um, into this idea that, you know, the church was perfect when it began mm-hmm. and then it became like a bit more rubbish as time mm-hmm. goes on. And um, while um, I'm sure that we can all identify um, examples in our own time and in other periods where the church has totally got it wrong, mm. um, I, I'm not convinced that the that the New Testament is entirely like evidence for like perfection that then yes. becomes, you know, yes. uh, which is actually something that Hans Kunzelman himself would agree with me on. That <laughs> it says, he said, has this quote about, you know, there never was such a sacred chorus. It always, mm. it all, the church from the beginning had, you know, it was in comprised of sinners. It was always, uh, it always had its its problems. Yes. But there was this kind of idea that some pin times people would still hear that it's, it's this idea that over time people, um, you know, sort of settled into a routine. They made a more mm. institutional church and, um, and they stopped worrying about the end of history and started talking about God's activity in our midst and lost that kind of radical edge. And maybe that comes from reflecting in their own context about the institutional nature of the church and uh, especially in the kind of um, richer parts of the world, uh, we might have quite some um, uh, isolation from from the kind of hard end of, of that. Um, but I think certainly within the, within you know, so this became part of the argument that Luke is already a part of this process of kind of creating kind of rubbish politics. Um, and, and I think actually what we find is that throughout Jewish literature and um, Christian literature of, of this time and, and before it, there, there's an amazing capacity to recalibrate hope on the basis of the time that has already elapsed without making it, um, and now we don't have any kind of hope for God to break in and make all things right, you know. So there's this, um, you know, so we see it, for instance, in, um, you know, Jeremiah has this kind of vision of like how long it will be until the end um, of the exile and God making all things right, which Daniel then reinterprets and says, oh, well, you heard Jeremiah say it would be this long, but really he meant like, you know, 70 weeks, you know, like it's doing this kind of expanding the time frame. Um, and fourth Ezra, which is a Jewish text from around the end of the first century, does a similar, a similar thing, recalibrating Daniel's prophecy to say, you know, well, actually, you know, you heard Daniel say this, but really it meant this. And always it gets recalibrated so that you always live on the cusp of God's of God's anticipated action to make things right. And I think that's just it, that's exactly what Luke does, um, reinterprets Mark's um, prophecy to make it so that you know all these other things have happened. You know this you've seen all this stuff happen with the fall of Jerusalem and stuff, but God's activity shows that something has radical has already happened in the resurrection, and the the final culmination remains imminent so be ready for it so there's this kind of solace and challenge that we find in that kind of eschatology as well i think liam you're muted i am too uh thank you for that uh one one question that just kind of popped into my head there as and, and you know i'm just throwing it out because it's an impossible question because um <laughs> thank that, you for giving that uh kind of precursor introduction yeah. this is impossible good <laughs> exactly so you can really just throw me one you know one word answer and just I'll demand ask you I move on. Next. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, because on sunday just yesterday yeah. i preached on uh, acts for the believers holding all things in common yeah. Uh, so if there is no um, sacred chorus, um, did the disciples, did the believers ever yeah. hold all things in common? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, this is what I'm on the By the World podcast for. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, well, I mean, it's an it's really interesting, right? Is this meant to be normative? Mm-hmm. Like, is this is this a statement of how we're all meant to be? Is it a historical statement about how that group of disciples were? Mm. Um, it's 
and because there's also there's this funny thing to hold intention with the beginning of act so that's from act four beginning of act six there's this thing where the greeks come to the apostles and complain that their the greek widows aren't getting their share of the food during the distribution so there is some mm. kind of tension in here um but i at the same time, we don't want to just fob it off and say, well, we're all rich Christians and the easiest way to do to deal with this is to say, well, they didn't ever really do this. <laughs> um, but to, to wonder about what it's doing in the text, where mm. the, what the challenge is, what the invitation is when you read this um, as mm. a little summary set of verses about what Christian disciples are, are called to be. And that passage, I mean, it does have an interesting thing, right, where it's got um, both the... Um, it's got the, the challenge about how they're living together, sharing all things in common and no one being without need. Um, but it also has, uh, and, and it also has stuff about that they're, they're proclaiming the resurrection, the power of the resurrection. So it's all of that stuff held together in this ideal Christian, the yeah. description of an ideal Christian life, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so you did very well for an impossible question. It was proved to be <laughs> hardly impossible at all. Um, <laughs> So I guess as we kind of cover, cover land of the plane, maybe in a, in a similar vein, I guess, for those who are, you know, turning, who were like you a decade or so ago, yeah. turning to Luke Acts and yeah. other books in scripture, but particularly just focus on Luke Acts um, in terms of preaching or yeah. Bible studies or personal devotion, um, whether or not it's particularly related to the question that you, you began with about negative yeah. aspects, or whether it's just more broadly of here's something I think from, from looking at Luke alongside all these texts and within all these scholarly debates, some things that I think are worthwhile holding close to our, mm. the front of our mind as we, mm. as we, as we read um, things that might help shape, you know, why the questions of time and eschatology or, 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 or questions of what Luke is doing in his um, riffing on what was there before him and around him, um, that that it is those questions that might be just half decent to hold nearby. Yeah. Do, do you have anything you, you can you can leave the listeners with on, on, on yeah, that yeah. kind of realm? Yeah. Um, I guess for people who um, have studied this stuff in theological college maybe a while ago or mm. whatnot to kind of just encourage people to check their assumption about the delayed parousia idea, the delay <laughs> of Jesus's return as being uh, central to Luke's um, eschatology mm. and, and to read the text as much as we can with fresh eyes and wonder if that is really mm. what's going on and how Luke's um, eschatology then, his understanding of the end of history uh, might also shape the politics that we see. Um, in in the text, what that means for Luke's understanding of the Roman Empire. Mm. Um, so certainly that stuff. Um, I would I would also caution about thinking. Uh, people will often talk about um, divine necessity in in Luke Acts, um, and just sort of noticing the dynamic that is at play there. Um, that it's. Um, that the divine necessity, the necessity in my way, and this is a really complicated, um, thorny issue, really. But in, to my mind, the necessity is the necessity to proclaim this good news, um, and uh, it's not a necessity uh, for suffering. So every now and then, mm. you'll find a passage that talks about necessity and suffering together. But if I think if you um, can look at that um, in its context, what we discover is that the nature of the good news and the nature of the world means that it will receive opposition, but it mm. doesn't mean that the divine plan is that there would be suffering mm. um, and that that can be a really important uh, tension, I think, in how we read these kinds of texts. And certainly um, any, anything, if we ever find ourselves with some kind of simplistic rhetoric that, that okay. we're telling someone who's suffering something uh, that that kind of makes it sound like well this was part of God's plan and it's it's necessary then we should be um, we should at least feel the 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 need to triple check that we're mm. that we're confident that that's what we're saying here because um, mm. that can be harmful and it's it's good to really think it to think it through and I think I mean I think that there is there is hope in this stuff 
really. And 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 I think it's it's interesting to to compare it to Jewish texts and know some of the similarities. Not mm. to not to read it as being a, um, a a conflict with with Judaism in general, even where there are particular Jewish characters who have run-ins with the apostles. Mm. But to notice that there's great continuity, even you know, even the passage you were preaching on um, yesterday, uh, that there. Um, that there are, say, texts within the Dead Sea Scrolls that talk about the need to, to contribute financially um, for people with various disabilities and various um, other kind of uh, reasons why they might not have money coming in. Mm. Uh, so the most vulnerable members of the community. Uh, so there is continuity um, with, between Judaism and, um, and Christianity on, on some of these themes. Um, and to just um, reflect a bit on that and reflect mm. a bit on... Uh, how we can find hope in these kinds of stories when read like that. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. So the book, folks, is Luke Acts and the End of History, out with De Gruta. Kylie Crabb, thank you so much uh, for writing the book and for joining us today on Love, Rinse, Repeat. Is there anything else you want to promote or plug? Uh, other ways people can connect with you? Uh, anything like that? Uh, I think that's... Oh, actually, I could do one plug, which Group. is to say that I've just recently... My, my next... Um, research project has been on disability in the ancient world and if people are interested um there's actually a series of bible studies that i did for the synod of victoria and tasmania mm. that are on the synod website you can kind of i think you can currently still just watch them as part of the business sessions which is mm -hmm. i think mm, i'm gonna get it wrong but i think it's business session one four and seven or something um but they're actually as of this week i think they should be up as separate um videos if people want to watch those um yeah there's a series of three cool and given that you know when you're talking about time and history and eschatology it will actually not be this week so they'll be yeah. clearly <laughs> out by the time that you're listening oh yeah this. of course <laughs> <laughs> um, very good so, so yes look for those because that, that does sound great and uh yeah Kyle, thank you for, for joining us today my pleasure thanks liam great to speak with you and all your listeners yeah it's very great see you all next week folks